thank you for joining us today. I am so excited because we are here with the showrunner and some of the incredible cast from Brave New World, which is streaming right now on Peacock. We're joined here today by David Wiener, Alden Ehrenreich, Kylie Bunbury, Joseph Morgan, Jessica Brown Finley, Harry Lloyd, Hannah John Common, and Nina Shasanya. Uh, thank you guys so much for, you know, virtually showing up from both the US and the UK today. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> 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 So to get things started, I kind of want to toss it over to David. Um, and for those who may not be familiar with the novel and have not or have just started the show, can you, and we've talked before, so I know this is going to be a very, this is hard because this is a grand show, in one to two sentences, set up the premise <laughs> for Brave New World. Okay. Uh <laughs> Brave New World is based on a novel by Aldous Huxley, and it takes place in a city called New London, where everyone is happy, or at least thinks they are. Um, and the show is about what happens when a man from outside of that city, from a place called the Savage Lands, John, comes to New London, and he brings with him all of these disruptive emotions and ideas that has a big impact on the people of New London and chaos and comedy and romance and all of that wonderful stuff ensues. Wow. Hey, was, did he do you. okay? <laughs> Sorry. Um, well, if, if, you, if that wasn't good enough, uh, which it was great, by the way, because I've seen all nine episodes and that was, um, we have a trailer that uh, some of the folks oh, cool. have not yet to see. I don't, uh, even the folks here on this panel may not have seen yet. So I would love to play that trailer for everyone. This is New London. Everyone's happy here. <laughs> Everyone has a place. There's no hunger, no violence. There's no pain there, John. I've always wanted that for you. This is your home now. All you have to do is connect. Everyone belongs to everyone else. If this place is so perfect, why is it upside down? There is a disruption. We need to stop this before this goes too far. We're at the beginning of something. necessary. If you're not happy, you're nothing at all. Yay! Yay. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> no matter how many, that was the first time that I've seen that trailer and I noticed the circles around the letters, um, which uh, is a very interesting thing for those who are going to be watching the show, you should be paying attention to those things. Um, David, I want to toss it back to you. You did so wonderful on, on your two sentences. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about why this novel adaptation, why this time for this show? Oh, yeah. Um, well, I, Aldous Huxley uh, in, wrote the book in 1932, and he was really prescient. He um, really could see the future and was concerned about how humans would use technology um, to prevent themselves from being uncomfortable. And he worried that that tendency would cause people to be, you know, so stimulated, so sexually sated, so pharmacologically numbed that they would stop existing really um, in the now. They wouldn't look inside themselves in an uncomfortable way and they wouldn't look outside themselves and consider uh, history in an uncomfortable way or the systems and hierarchies around them. Um, and I think, you know, it, you could argue that now it's probably more important than ever for people to be able to do that. Um, and we have a lot of, uh, you know, Puxy was, I guess, to some extent right about us because we have a lot of technological ways to keep ourselves from confronting ideas that don't align with ours and um, we're pretty good at entertaining ourselves. Uh, so I think like, you know, it's one of those really, really 
um, rare books that becomes more um, resonant and, and relevant uh, as time goes on. And I think that uh, now is quite a moment to, to have the show on the air. Yeah. Well, from a show of hands, because obviously we are doing this virtually, how many members of the cast, and this is not a trick question, um, because I'm sure many people will pick up A Brave New World after watching the show or before watching the show. And it is, it is a, a book that has been in circulation for I mean, since 1932, you know, how many of you were actually uh, familiar with the subject matter with the book before uh, you took the role? I hadn't read it, but I <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'd heard of it. <laughs> Who read it? I, I read it in I read it in high school, but I didn't, um, you know, I didn't really, I didn't remember it because I think I was way too young to really kind of engage with the ideas. I remember like it was, it was titillating, like it had some, a little sex in it, but, um, but yeah, it seemed like, you know, kind of, uh, it, well, it was assigned. So I, I probably found a way around it, but it wasn't until I, when I read it as an adult, I was blown away. I never read it like, I, I, I was familiar with 1984 and like The Handmaid's Tale, and which uh, I think are kind of grouped together with, with that, but I'd never read it. Um, I read the scripts first and then after I took the part, I, I read the, uh, the book. Um, I preferred the scripts, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> as controversial <laughs> as that may sound. I did, because I thought they were more accessible, although the book was great and it, you know, obviously it, it you know, was this imagining of a world which we, we'd never seen before. I, I just, um, the scripts kind of were the gateway to the book for me, so they grabbed me more. Which I think is really interesting because David and I have talked, uh, I am also the host of A Brave New Pod, which is Sci-Fi Wires and, and Peacocks, is the official podcast that goes along with the show. Oh, and cool. it is a strong, it is a departure uh, in many ways from the book, you know, for, those of you though whose characters are actually in the book <clears throat> uh, that's, did, not did you... that's not why that's not that's not why <laughs> i'm looking scanning through desperate like where's the just <laughs> for those of you and, and particularly for alden and jessica and harry um how much were you able and for nina um how much were you able to venture back to the source material and pull from your characters? Um, because even um, Hannah, your character is there, but it's a very different twist, correct? Yeah, yeah that's correct. It's a, <laughs> I'm a she. Um, but no, it's, I, I mean, when anything is ever adapted from a book personally, I don't take anything. I completely have a fresh, mind and a fresh kind of attitude with the script and and the text and characters and you know I, I always kind of have a complete fresh outlook when it comes to taking on a role for uh, an on a, in a script adaptation rather than kind of going to a book and um going from there so for me it was kind of new just to kind of take helm and and bring her to life alden i saw you yeah, I mean, to me, like, I've been a part of a few projects that are based on different source material. And to me, like, the, the real danger is being too devoted or loyal to the book because the feelings that are, uh, that you can convey through literature, you can't just then show those events and expect those same feelings to be communicated. So I think, like, in in this, what was really wonderful is is David and the writers doing, I think, the most important thing, which is finding the essence or finding the emotional experience of the source material and finding a way to get those feelings across through the medium of whatever we call things now, I guess TV, through through the visual medium. Um, and uh, and I thought they did a great job with that and also updating it to our world in certain corners that needed a, a sort of, you know, it's 1932. How much of it still stands is pretty remarkable. Uh, I don't know how many other books from 1932 we could do a series adaptation of and keep like, you know, I don't know, seven mm -hmm. uh, sort of. 
Well, and Nina, your character also is from the book and also uh, is not a woman. Um, how, how was it, how much of the source material were you able to kind of pull into the world controller role? Um, just a, a sense of absolute arrogance, I guess. That's just from being a world controller. That's kind of the only thing that's carried over, I guess, because it's, it's yeah, as the others were saying, it's, well, for a start, the, the book is kind of small. It's kind of like a, it's kind of like a thought experiment. It's sort of a, it's sort of, something happens, but not much happens. <laughs> it's a good book. <laughs> I'm not, it's a terrible book. No, it's a really good book, but it's very small. And this has kind of been stretched and 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 uh, magnified and made much more. Um, uh, and the same with the character as well. It kind of just made sense that uh, Mustafa was female. That didn't particularly, it wasn't an issue. It's, it's how it goes these days, as it should. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah. And and Harry, who you know, you play Bernard. Um, if you're American, Bernard. Um, Bernard. <laughs> Bernard. Bernard. Bernie. <laughs> oh, which I absolutely adore that that Helm calls him Bernie. Um, you know, your character. Some might say when they watch the series does remain in some ways one of the closest interpretations of the character in. In some ways, um, were you, were you, but there was definitely a twist to it. How much did you bring from, from, you know, your, your perspective? Well, I think I, I mean, everything I brought, I guess I brought from my perspective, but I didn't, the, the book kind of scared me because I hadn't read it. And I kind of felt guilty when I read this two episodes in a script that came my way and I loved it. And I didn't know how much of that was borrowed and how much of that was kind of augmented and enhanced, but I was like, I'm just in, I just what a great package. How are you going to make this? And then I kind of got the part and then read the book and already was invested in the series and had had conversations with David about where it was going. And so I was kind of conflicted when I read Bernard and he does share some of the same traits and that he's hypocritical and he can be jealous and he can be petty and he shares a lot of the negative attributes but i think we carve out a few new uh, aspects to him and i think he's braver i think he does feel this question like lanina does and yes he gets distracted by just trying to get rid of it with the soma like everyone else as he becomes more important that seems to satisfy him enough but he um he he has the courage of his convictions, I think, more in our version. And I have to say, since I read that book before we started shooting, I didn't really pick it up again, for better or worse. Well, and that lends us to the scripts. And I kind of want to toss it to Kylie and Joseph for this, because your two characters are something that I think the audience will get so, like, so much more of. Um, uh, we do have friends of Lenina's in the book, but not to this extent where there is a friendship relationship um, that Kylie and Lenina have. And for you in reading the scripts for the first time, Joseph, we know you love them, uh, but <laughs> Kylie, like what were your initial like first thoughts when you picked the script up? Um, well, well, for me personally, the reason why I was attracted to Franny was because it was a character I'd never really played before. Um, uh, a character where, I mean, Franny likes the conditioning. Um, she likes staying unconscious and she wants it to be that way. Um, so for me, I, I gravitated toward the, um, the fact that she, I'm so bad at these things. <laughs> Take your time. Your character is very complicated. <laughs> Your yeah, character no, is very is complicated, complicated, sis. Like she doesn't want to find herself. She's she's completely okay. To her, uniformity is bliss because social stability is everything. And when Lenina, her best friend, uh, starts questioning things, it's very threatening, threatening to her. But um, for me, I, I liked her femininity, um, and it was just just something different and out of the box. Such a departure from what I've played before. And so Joseph, I kind of want to tweak the question for you now because one of the things that your character CJAC60 represents is the level system. 
is this idea of the hierarchy and this idea of, of I mean, for lack of a better word, a caste system. Um, and it is a very big departure from the book in that this is an aspect of a world, of a brave new world that we haven't seen before. In, in kind of reading that and seeing as you being that, that point of view, what were your initial first thoughts as you were developing out this role of CJAC 60? Well, you know, uh, we meet CJAC 60 just after he's experienced this traumatic event of his, his friend, uh, CJAC 57 dying, also played by me, by the way. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> as, as well, so well CJAC 45, and no, we can do it all day. Um, but, but uh, you know, the, the really interesting thing for me about these guys is uh, the Epsilons there, a, a single egg is split into, in the book, I think it's 96 identical Epsilons. And then they're suppressed, their emotions and their development is suppressed with sort of alcohol whilst they're still in the test tube. Um, because they're all test tube babies, you know, or they're, they're born in a lab, not, not of a mother. And so um, the interesting thing was sort of, how do you how to play this this guy who's kind of su suppressed in that way and how to n not make him robotic you know and so I, I went from a start point of sort of trying to make him um almost like a child or a dog i guess um so so it's kind of meditative because he he doesn't uh think about the past at all any events that have happened to him, he doesn't consider, and he doesn't think about the future, what's coming. It's really just reacting to the stimulation in front of him and then his programming, which he's had. So it was, uh, actually, I found it quite difficult to sort of stop the voices and to try and just be in the moment, which is, I think, what we are looking to do as actors in any role is to try and stay present and be in the moment. But for me, that was like integral to see Jack's character development and, uh, yeah, and so it, what was interesting is to, um, you know, we met him, like I said, just after he'd experienced this traumatic event. So he was already starting to change. So the starting point I took him from had happened off camera, but I was able to use that then for all my other cats, my other sea jacks that I played. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I came in there. The range. Um, oh. And that kind of brings me, like you mentioned the word friend, which is in this world very, controversial like you're like an epsilon has a friend and epsilon has um, uh, emotions and this is really interesting journey um that we see that character go through as well as if you know no spoilers um the rest of the sea jacks that you play uh go through in the the rest of the show um and i think that's such an interesting thing of discovering emotions and that brings up the strong women characters that are in the show. And I kind of want to toss this next question to Jessica and Kylie, because there's a very unique, very strong relationship between Franny and Lenina, um, and also Lenina and Linda, uh, who are all beta, beta pluses, right? You are all supposed to be, quote unquote, the same. Um, but one of my biggest questions is like, how did you go about that relationship, evolving that relationship. And honestly, are Franny and Lenina actually friends? Cause I'm very, I don't, mm, I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure. <laughs> Kylie, yes, they're friends. <laughs> um, no, let's let Jess go. Jess hasn't talked yet. <laughs> um, I mean, uh, I think uh, there were, there were definitely moments um, during filming where I would look at Kylie and just say, oh my God, I'm the worst friend ever. Um, we had a lot of those moments, actually. Why, why do I still want to be around you? I, well, I think I think there's so much in Lenina that she, she is afraid, she knows could be so harmful and destructive to Franny. I guess you choose to put yourself in situations and it's your choice and that's what you're willing to take on. But to then do that to someone you care about, obviously omitting truth is a form of, of lying and if you have a friendship, that's not what you do. And yet there is so much love in trying to protect someone, even if it means sort of pushing someone away. You know, so often you, you you have to push someone away just because otherwise it's, it will destroy them and you don't want 
them to come to harm. And I, so I, I feel like there's part of that there. Um, and Lenina tries, but I guess they are just, they are really different people, but that's one of the reasons why she loves Franny so much, I think. Yeah, and, and Lenina pushes Franny, pushes Franny away, but initially she wants, she's trying to bring Franny, she's trying to make Franny see the truth and see that she doesn't need the somas or that there is something else going on inside. And Franny just resists that. Um, yeah. So I do think that, you know, it started off with you trying to take Franny to, to the lighter side, but. Franny yeah. said, no, take me to a party. Apparently, <laughs> <laughs> in the dark side, I'm just going to put my light on because it's not there. <laughs> you know, Franny um, said, Franny wants to take them to all the parties. David? Uh, I was just going to say that, you know, one of the things that I was really struck by once we started making the show and that was really fun to react to as a writer was how much of the show is actually about friendship and how kind of radical that notion is, you know, in New London. And one of the things that starts to happen at the beginning of our story is we we start to see that these people aren't robots, you know, they're they have, you know, they're there's that they're conditioned not to so much, you know, um, lean into the sentiment and because you know part of being friends with someone is sometimes getting hurt, you know, it's caring about someone enough that you're vulnerable to them. And if you look at the whole show, like it's really just a bunch of different webs of friendship. Franny and Lenina have a particular kind of friendship. Um, you know, Mustafa and a guy named Elliot have a really particular kind of old friendship. And um, obviously like one of the ones that I think was, was like for me, one of the more resonant and fun ones is the one between Helm and Bernard because you have these two people that kind of know the way it's supposed to work and, and act correctly outside of their relationship. But when they get together, like they do kind of, acknowledge that the system may not be totally perfect, that maybe they're not totally perfect. Um, and it feels like there's these really lived in friendships and then a friendship, a real one forms between, but an unequal one forms between John and Bernard and and oddly between John and Jack. And so like, it would be kind of reductive to say like, oh, the show is just about, as I often do, I go, oh, it's about the problems of monogamy and it's about the love triangle. But really it's about all these friendship connections that that I think unfold in different ways throughout the series I think it, and it's, it's something that because you know and I'm not just saying this but like we have a group of people that like it was just a, a pleasure like they like each other and you'd start to see like the authentic friendships that were happening off camera start to resonate in front of the lens and that like makes for a really kind of interesting chemistry I think you know if we have that in space which is really great well that is a great segue because I think you know, I wanted to toss it over to two very strong relationships that Bernard has with uh, two folks, which is Harry, you and you and Alden, John the Savage and Bernard. Are you friends? Are you not friends? Half the time I think that Bernard wants to protect them. Half the time I'm thinking Bernard just wants to climb up the ladder. Like this is a very complicated relationship that both of you have, even at a certain point, having a fake fight um, amongst yourselves. Like how was it developing out the relationship? Because both of you seem like you were having both a lot of fun, but also were very stressed out about uh, making this develop on screen. We'll start off with you, Alden. Um, it was great. It was really easy. It was really easy. We really had fun, you know, just to, to, to add to what David said, I think that my experience of this show was a lot about um, how strong I felt all the people you're seeing and, and others that aren't here worked as an ensemble, how much devotion and dedication and preparation and care everyone put into uh, their roles and what they were doing. And that was a very different experience than I've had in other things. And so it was really, um, really great. And, and Harry certainly exemplifies that. And, we, and it's just a lot, of, a lot of fun. So it was really, that was easy and, and doing those scenes were really fun. I am, um, I, I found it really hard work actually. I, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, it was great. And because the series starts with a bang, you kind of have episodes one, two, three, and then uh, for whatever reason, 
it kind of there's a there's a new beginning and i then there was opportunity which i didn't know about when we started making it uh the details of it and we got these scenes where bernard who had shown himself like lenina to be someone questioning the system and struggling with this internal question mark actually as soon as he has the whiff of popularity or that people do treat him like the alpha plus he feels he isn't really then actually it's fine and hey pop a soma let's go to the pleasure gardens and he gets to try and chivy uh john along who's you know the reluctant savage but ultimately um is a human being and so we had a lot of fun i think in the middle part of the series uh and a lot of kind of late night shoots kind of playing games with alden and jesse uh so it was you know it was a really it was a family making it 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 i hadn't thought of it as a web of friendships but i think that that feels right I think that's an interesting part to bring up because Hannah, your character, Helm, uh, Wilhelmina, uh, instead of Hemholtz, uh, in, in the show is, is one of the most conflicted characters. Like she is all about feelings and feelies, but hasn't truly had a chance to be able to feel. Um, and for you, I feel like in mentioning the pleasure gardens, this seems like something your character is always in search of. How did you develop that out? And were there any kind of inspirations you had in, I'll, I'll say this, the first time I saw Wilhelmina Holtz, I was like, oh, okay, this is, this is where we're going. Um, it literally jumps off the screen and it, it, it is something that looks like you developed and spent a lot of time bringing to life. Um, I mean, Helm is just such a, she was such a fun character to play and really just an amazing character to really get my teeth stuck into because it's just this kind of wonderful kind of hedonistic, chaotic, creative artist that kind of, you know, is escaping in at the same time as getting inspiration. Hence why she does take more Soma than let's say the others in, uh, in the show. And, um, and I mean, there's a real vulnerability to her that, I mean, that was actually the real fun bit um, for me as a character and just, I, just discovering that kind of vulnerable side and and the kind of pressure that she puts herself under after kind of every single pleasure bomb and every feely she creates and every sensation she creates and her own journey and her own kind of self-discovery is a really beautiful one and it's a very sobering one. Um, and. I mean, that's why it's, I think it's just a lovely relief as well whenever you see her and Bernie together because it's kind of, she's this one, she's uh, someone in front of everybody else and her team and she's, you know, the alpha plus, but then behind closed doors, it's like she kind of just kicks off the heels and gets to actually kind of relax and be herself around Bernard and he gets to see that kind of depression and that, and that kind of, in that chaos and that creativity with her. And she's always observing her own masterpiece. She's always kind of, I call it the her own Pagliacci of New London. She'll never be able to actually be in the midst of what she creates. And that's kind of the tragedy of it. Yeah. Well, Nina, your character, World Controller Mons, seems to be above all of this spray. Uh, everything we have talked about um, doesn't seem to be affecting her in the same way until she runs into C-Jack 60. Uh, for some reason, she now gets very involved in the whole situation of John the Savage being introduced and this new situation that's happening. For you in creating the world controller with this level of depth and, and again, without any spoilers, because there's a lot more to the story that I can't wait for audiences to see, what are your relationships to the rest of the characters that are on the board at, you know, while all this is happening? Hmm. Well, trying to explain anything about Mustafa Mond is really tricky without spoilers because everything that she is, she's kind of her own special creation. And the whole reason why she's her, her own special creation is because, is because of what's happens and what's gone you know so that's really tricky but but she she is yeah she's the puppet master so to her these people have sort of ceased to be people for quite a while and so in terms of her sort of relationship with each it's kind of 
although she's been around for a while. Um, these relationships that start to to blossom and flower. Oh, everything I want to say gives it away. Okay, <laughs> but, but with CJ, with, with CJ sixty, um, that is uh, a crack in her beautiful. She she's trying to create something or to 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 keep something level. She's trying to keep everything level, peaceful, stable. Um, she may have become slightly obsessed with doing that because that's kind of all she's doing. She doesn't seem to have that many actual relationships. When so, when Sujak, uh, sixty, um, and when John Savage turns up in her perfect world, it's completely discombobulating, and she is starting to feel out of control, which is anathema to her. So, uh, yeah, in terms of her relationship with everybody. They're kind of just all annoying. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> because they're kind of they're kind of specks of dust on her lens on her beautifully clear lens. They're kind of ruining things. For her. <laughs> well, Alden for John, you know, you just heard Nina talk about how this this perfect world. That's not the way everyone views New London, though, right? It it is the savages feel like there's a very different perspective. Um, and your your mother in the story, uh, who was played by Demi Moore, Linda, who also is a, a grand departure from the book, um, but also has the very same connection. She's from New London. How was it for you bringing to life this, this very complex narrative of technically being a New Londoner, but also technically being a savage? Yeah, I mean, I had the benefit that, that no one else here really had, which is that I just was uh, a person who comes from a world much closer to the world we actually live in. So wrapping my head around what it would be like to be, to have grown up with all that conditioning and all that is something I didn't have to do. And the savage aspect is just what they call human people who are still sort of full human beings emotionally. Um, and I think... Uh, you know, John, for, for all the deprivation of the Savage Lands and how, what a tough world it is, he, like many people there probably, have, has developed a kind of emotional intelligence or street smarts that when he gets to New London, as dominating and, and uh, intimidating as a world as it seems, he also becomes very aware very quickly that the people are sort of innocent in a way um and and bristles i think rightly at at it feels creepy for everyone to not be feeling what they're feeling and lying all the time and pretending everything's fine all the time it's weird and it's creepy and um and uh and and that feels real so uh i think uh you know that's what he's he realizes this is weird and I'm gonna, I'm gonna start screwing with it. Uh, D David, did he, did he hit it right? Is it, Cause I, my next question for everybody is that if you had one word to your character's immediate response to John being introduced into New London society, what would it be? Are you going to me first? Please. I'm gonna go to you first cause I'm not gonna put any of them on the spot. I'm gonna give them a chance to, to, to think first. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, the the thing about, I think, the, I guess, I think, like, what, what Alden's talking about is that there's a difference in how these people are expected to behave, and they've gotten really good at behaving that way, and they're conditioned to behave that way. And naturally, if you're that way, and then this guy shows up, and he's not like you, there's a couple people have you know, they have biases, like the people of New London look down on the people from the Savage Lands. They go there to have their sense of superiority reinforced. And I think like when John first comes to New London, you know, what we see in the Savage Lands prior to that is what happens when you take dignity away from people. You know, so John gets caught up with um, this woman, Sheila, is played by Kate Fleetwood. And, and so, you know, he knows what it's like to be looked down upon. And I think what's the, what changes about John is that 
when he arrives in New London, the attention given to him is actually kind of, in a way, positive. People are curious about him. Um, they may be curious and yet, you know, also condescending, but they're curious because he is so different. And we see like, you know, that they, they like a little newness. They like a little change. I think there's a part in the sixth episode where Bernard's talking to John on the subway and, and on the helix and, and explains to him that in New London, celebrity only lasts like between breakfast and dinner time. And that no one, you know, kind of has the staying power. Trends change every day. Um, and that John and Bernard are both kind of struck by, huh, we've been, we've got some, stay we've been around for six days. And I think both of them, there's a bit of a twinkle, you know, that Bernard's like, six days, that's a lot. So um, I think like that, that, anyway, I guess the, the point is that, John, it's not simply like John collides with New London and then they reject him. It's they embrace him in a way, but they embrace him kind of through the lens of their own experience. And so for just to, like John represents and carries every emotion and feeling that they've been learning to suppress. Right. So when you encounter people that embody something you've decided you aren't going to be, it's a very charged uh, reaction. Yeah, and for Bernard, it's also the challenge to my job is to integrate him, is to get to teach him that these emotions are unnecessary. You can be happy all the time. It's really seductive. Just take this pill, man. So for, in terms of picking a word for how Bernard feels about John, it's this opportunity because suddenly it makes Bernard important. But he's also kind of jealous because when John does get attention, dude, I'm, I'm the diplomat. I, I brought him here. I, I drove a car, right? you know, he, so it, it starts to you start to see the, the the beginnings of jealousy, which is something that um, is a crack that fishes later. Kylie, your character sees John's intrusion into New London a little differently, though. Yeah, um, I think originally it, it was curiosity, but then it turned into a threat. I'm gonna push over to uh, Jessica and then Hannah. Um, I think how I sort of everything. I think Lenina is, we first meet her and, and in a sort of vacuum of, of space in her, she's looking for something and then suddenly one person's presence is everything, yeah. which can be wonderful and also terrifying. So sort of all of it. <laughs> Um, I think for Helm, it's just fascination. Um, you know, it's kind of, who is this fascinating creature um, that I'd like to <clears throat> absolutely kind of discover and um, it's new and for Helm, especially for who she is and what she does, um, it's very exciting. <laughs> Mina and then Joseph. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think because of who um, Mond, because of the arrogance I was talking about, she sees everybody in terms of herself. So I think when John turns up, she sees him as a challenge uh, um, initially, sort of a personal challenge. Um, and then and then he morphs into something quite potentially destructive. Joseph, I think for for your character, it's not it's not even destructive at all, it, it, or it, or is it? Well, I mean, eventually, perhaps, but uh, I think the word I would choose is choice, because uh, all of these emotions that C. Jack is just starting to struggle with and doesn't have the vocabulary to process, um, and these questions about his place in the world that he's starting to deal with. Um, here comes here comes a guy who says, hey, you don't have to live like this and you don't have to, this doesn't have to be your place in the world and there's a choice. And that is the huge thing that resonate, resonates with uh, C. Jack. Well, it seems like at the end of the day, the biggest choice is happiness or freedom. And so the best way uh, to end this is I gotta ask very quickly, like very quickly, your choice, happiness or freedom. We are going to start with Kylie. Freedom. Jessica. Freedom. Joseph. Freedom. 
Nina. Okay, freedom. It's <laughs> <laughs> Harry. Freedom. Hannah. Freedom, because freedom is happiness. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Alden. Yeah, I'd say that I guess freedom is happiness. It's hard to say, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you all so very much. David, would you like to chime in? I feel like at this point, if you said happiness, everyone would be very confused. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I won't say it, but we know, right? Like we know. We, yeah. we know, it's all, totally. it's all about Red Soma, I got it. Um, well, not Red Soma. Uh, do you, everyone should watch the show about why that was a bad joke. Um, I wanna thank you all so very, very much uh, for being here. Uh, I have been talking to the showrunner and some amazing, amazing, amazing talent from the cast of A Brave New World, which is a brand new original streaming right now on Peacock. Wave. Yeah, we can wave. Bye. We can wave. Bye. They're not gonna wave back, but we can wave at them. <laughs>